Welcome, everyone. Don't forget to press the mic when you want to, when you want to speak. Um, Camilla and Jennifer are coming on their way, and we've got apologies for Mike, who is doing um, <coughs> lead, leading an inspection at Barking Herring and Redbridge. Uh, Harbring, yeah, and Redbridge. Right, everyone happy with the minutes? Yeah, I, I think that most of the action points are picked up in David's report and elsewhere, so we'll come back to them at the end if they're not, for some reason. Um, and David, can we go straight into your report, please? Thank you, David. Good morning. Uh, thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so, um, slightly briefer than the last one, and I'll do it uh, quickly. Um, um, to welcome uh, Steve and uh, Andrea uh, to their first formal meeting. I think Andrea was uh, doing a guest appearance at the last meeting, but um, I am confirming that um, Steve and Andrea now join Mike, and we've got a full complement of chief inspectors. Um, I've spoken to about a dozen people uh, who have an interest in corporate services and, <coughs> pardon me, HR uh, directors post, and I hope over the next week we can actually make some progress and actually bring somebody in in relation to those uh, positions. Uh, David and myself and a uh, member of the exec team will work out um, uh, the interview timetable for those. Uh, there's a further report elsewhere in the agenda, but. Um, I'm just covering in the next paragraph the high-level progress in relation to the transformation. Um, we've got um, a programme plan in place for the transformation. Um, we're developing, in parallel to that, um, a training and development plan around the academy. Uh, the change to the new organisational structure is really where the senior team are going to focus on the period between now and the end of the year. We had a uh, on Monday of this week, a conference where we got 300 managers from within CQC. So whether people manage one person or manage 30 people, we brought everybody together and went through this. Um, feedback has been inordinately positive about the direction. There's a, that's mixed with anxiety about people having to change their jobs. Um, but I was uh, really, really pleased with the um, reaction and the response to the um, uh, to the programme, so uh, it's full speed ahead on that, and uh, there'll be further engagement with commissioners uh, and board members on this issue as we move forward. We do need, however, to bring in some additional capacity uh, to help us to do this, and um, uh, I'll be bringing forward proposals in that respect uh, in due course. And then later this month, beginning of next month, we begin a gateway review from the Department of Health, which is a, an external scrutiny of the programme arrangements and uh, a check and a test of whether we're good to go. Uh, Care Bill goes into uh, 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 Parliament. Um, it will be the clauses which affect us are going to be considered um, today and uh, next week. Um, and I'm just pointing out here the uh, announcement the Secretary of State made at the Conservative Party conference about the government will move amendments in the Care Bill in relation to uh, the independence of CQC. Uh, still on legislation, the Department will publish for consultation later this month draft regulations, which will be the basis of the legal, the legal basis of the judgments that we'll make on our new methodologies. So that's a significant publication that will go out. We've um, uh, made changes to the way that we uh, are registering um, and um, um, the action that we're taking in relation to the issuing of fixed penalty notices, which you discussed at uh, the last board meeting. So I'm providing an update here on uh, the work that we'll, uh, uh, are putting in place to advance that. On performance uh, for this current year, uh, you've not got the detailed report in this agenda. Uh, performance uh, remains on track. I receive a weekly monitoring report in relation to this, as do the regional directors. And um, uh, progress is good. Slightly behind uh, plan for this time of year, but the bank uh, has now been recruited to, at the time of uh, drafting this, we've got 192 uh, bank inspectors that will be assisting in um, delivering the programme. Uh, paragraph 7, I've highlighted uh, um, an FOI request that we got from the MP Stephen Barclay, which uh, received uh, a fair degree of publicity, press coverage, over the weekend of the 5th and 6th of October, uh, and just set out our decision uh, to publish this information. Um, the key issue from CQC's point of view was about whether we'd extended the courtesy to previous ministers and advising them that we'd publish this, um, we'd release this information for publication. Um, 
um, anticipating that this would uh, find its way into the press. Uh, we didn't uh, advise these two ministers that um, before um, the, um, we issued this information, and um, we should have done that, and that was a courtesy we should have extended. The Cabinet Office guidelines in relation to previous ministers is about the publication of documents, and I draw a distinction there between documents and emails. Uh, but nevertheless, we feel that we should have extended that courtesy. You asked, uh, and I think this picks up on your introduction, David, at the previous meeting there was an action about what our engagement is with local authorities in relation to children's safeguarding and uh, looked after children's work. And what I've tried to do in uh, paragraph 9, with the assistance of the colleagues that lead this work directly, is just set out what our locus is. Essentially what this is saying is our locus in children's safeguarding and children looked after is to focus on the healthcare needs of those children and what it is that healthcare organisations contribute to meeting the welfare and wellbeing of those children and therefore our locus isn't with local authorities. What we've done in the bullet points at the bottom of page 5 and the top of page 6 is, so, uh, is set out where we find issues in relation to the welfare and wellbeing of children. We can draw those to the attention of Ofsted, to the local children's safeguarding board, um, and they can then be picked up in the work that those organisations do. And then the last um, point just to draw out, David, is that you and I um, are to appear before the Select Committee, the Health Select Committee, next week uh, for our annual accountability meeting. Um, so that's the report. Sorry. I think um, this um, uh, clarifies the position about looked after children is very, very helpful. But this area, more than any other, is one where we know that um, cases fall through the cracks. And if we just get um, stuck on a very close definition of our responsibilities, um, we could end up being on the wrong side of a very bad case and, and poor publicity. So while this is necessary, um, I think you know, the staff have to be a bit sort of outgoing on this. Possibly? Um, I think uh, the staff that undertake this work are well aware of the risks that run, and I think the recent case reviews have actually uh, demonstrated what the risks are of people not recognising the signs and symptoms and then uh, communicating effectively. So um, I think they are alert to it um, and um, are, are constantly vigilant about this. Um, I think this is something that we actively need to consider. Um, Camilla's been raising questions with me as well about this, and I just think we should continue to debate uh, how we're positioning this to make sure we've got the most effective arrangements uh, in place whilst we've got this responsibility. If, um, if there's a view that this isn't responsibility we need to take, then we can consider that as well. But at the minute, um, I think this is just a straight response to the question that was asked about what our engagement with local authorities are. I think your broader point about how we... Uh, discharge our responsibilities is, is key. Um, the team that have the responsibility for this have worked quite hard with Ofsted to make sure that we're actually joined up with, uh, with Ofsted. Um, uh, you know, we need to be constantly vigilant about this and never satisfied we've got it right. <coughs> Just on that, David, I mean, who, who does the inspections? I mean, do we have specialists doing these inspections? Yeah, so there's a team uh, that's headed up by Sue McMillan and... Um, in our new structure, we propose that Steve will lead on this, where all the integrated work goes in Steve's um, directorate, and it will be his team. So that team of inspectors will transfer to him. These are all people with a health and care background uh, who are carrying out these inspections, and they're led by uh, Sue McMillan, who, McMillan, who's one of our senior managers. So um, uh, the normal debate about what is the background of these people, etc., these are all people with a health and care background who have some experience of working in children's services. Camilla, did you, you, you've got views in this area, I know, and a lot of experience in it. Do you want to add anything to it? No need to, if you don't. No, I mean, I think I've made my piece clear. I mean, I'm concerned about this. I'm not sure what... The, I, I think we need to just, as Steve said, be a bit careful. And I'm not clear, I'm still not entirely clear what value we're adding to it. What is a very complicated picture where there are an enormous amount of regulators already. So, I mean, but I think we're going to have that discussion. So we just don't want to really go over it now. That's right. David, uh, Camilla and myself have been in correspondence. So we'll have the conversation and just run through uh, the arguments. Um, I think um, the key issue here is that... Um, what we did was a contribution to the multi-agency inspections that Ofsted led. 
the tradition around multi-agency inspections really comes from Victoria Climbier and Herbert Lehman's report, when one of the challenges to the inspectorates was they weren't joined up. And therefore, one of those recommendations was that Ofsted, as the children's inspectorate, should lead multi-agency inspections. What they required, though, was that the other inspectorates would contribute to those multi-agency teams. And, of course, one of the big issues in children's safeguarding is the health contribution to safeguarding. So our predecessor body, the Healthcare Commission and CQC, uh, subsequently had significant contributions to play towards those multi-agency inspection teams. I did the probation inspector, I did the police inspector, um, because, uh, for obvious reasons, they're involved in relation to um, a variety of um, parts where the criminal justice system touches the inspection. The decision was taken by Ofsted that they wanted to focus on their own work, and they have stood down, for a two-year period, the multi-agency inspection. The issue that it then leaves for us is whether, uh, not just us, but um, uh, broader interest, I, I mean the Department of Health here, NHS England, um, uh, will be satisfied with no inspection taking place, no external scrutiny taking place of uh, the health contribution to children's safeguarding. So that's the issue that I think we need to be clear about. And then I think there's a secondary question about, is what we do effective? So there's what is the function we're being asked to carry out, and in carrying out that function, can we be clear that what we do is effective? I think they're both absolutely legitimate questions, and as we go through this process of reviewing what we do, how we do it, who we do it with, it's a legitimate question for us to ask, so uh, I think we should do that. Meanwhile, we've got an inspection programme that, uh, until we change it, I think we should continue with that inspection programme. Uh, thanks. Uh, I mean, it does seem like uh, an anomaly that, that um, some of the most vulnerable people, in the, because of their health problems, are, are not primarily our concern, if I can put it that way. And, and it's not difficult to see how, that might, how that's come about because of a series of reports and uh, uh, investigations from a particular perspective, from a social care perspective, from a, a criminal justice perspective. But, uh, but the, the fact is that the other organisations have different priorities from us. They're, their expertise is likely to be less than ours. Uh, their interest is likely to be slightly different. Um, and, and yet the long-term consequences for some of the children we're talking about may well be more dependent on what happens to their health care than it is on what happens to some of the other uh, um, agency involvements. So uh, I can see why we are in the position we're in at the moment, but that doesn't feel like a very com comfortable position for the future. And so it would be useful to know what, what kind of reconsideration of this might happen? I understand that you know the CQC has a broad agenda already. Um, you know, w whether whether this will, is likely to change, whether our uh, role will be um, either cut out more uh, sort of discrete role where we take responsibility for a particular bit of the care, or whether our involvement will be greater, more formal. One of the complaints of agencies on the ground, by the way, is often that health doesn't get involved very well. Um, where health is not the primary agency. So we, we're not very good at being, the, at being second in, in this multi-agency discussion. Uh, and uh, while that, uh, and you, know, you could argue that one of the, um, one of the, the ways in which that, pos that secondary position is confirmed is the position of CQC in relation to inspections. So it doesn't feel very comfortable that we don't have a primary role in the care of these people. In, so my question is whether, we are, whether there will be plans to change that, or at least discuss poss the possibility of change. Um, and the second thing is that in the meantime, uh, because there will be a meantime anyway, um, do we know what happens once we've made um, recommendations, once we've shared the information with Ofsted, as the report says, do we, do we know what then happens to that? Do they report back to us on uh, how they deal with that, and do we, do we have any kind of follow-up through the local authority? So. Um I think we do have a primary role, uh, and the primary role is to uh, inspect the healthcare contribution to children who need safeguarding and children looked after. And the purpose of that inspection is to check the uh, effectiveness of those services in safeguarding looked after children and safeguarding children who are in need and vulnerable. So I think we do have a role. Um, 
terms of what happens next, any information we'd share with Ofsted would inform their future inspection plans um, uh, of both local authorities and local children's safeguarding board. Um, my personal view about where we should go with this is um, I think this is a key part of our role. I think it's been scoped in our role. We've been given resources to actually take this role forward. Um, uh, my, uh, uh, your observation, Lewis, that um, many other agencies reflect on the absence of health at children's safeguarding meetings, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why safeguarding inspections need to be multi-agency. I thought Lord Lehman had it right that uh, if we're wanting people to behave in a multi-agency way at a local level, then the inspection of that should be multi-agency as well. So I think we should continue to contribute to make sure we're doing this work effectively, um, that the impact of this work and the outcome of this work is leading to improvements and it is a challenge that we put back into the system that leads to those services improving the, the way they actually provide this. One of the key issues as we go around um, doing our hospital inspections is how much prominence are we giving to safeguarding? How far do we check when we're embarking today how that safeguarding work is being taken forward? They've got a children's unit, they've got a maternity unit. Um, we also need to do that around, I don't want to blur the debate, but we need to do that around adult abuse as well. So I think it needs to be an essential and integral part of why we're here. It's a key part of the role we've got around safety. Uh, and the safety of healthcare services and how those services promote the safety and well-being of, of children. But I don't think we should rule anything out in terms of our review of what is it we do, why are we doing it, how are we doing it, and are we doing it in the most effective way. We, we'll talk elsewhere in um, this agenda about a root and branch reform of the way that we're inspecting and regulating. And I think we should include children's safeguarding in that as well. There's a key issue when we get to mental health, as you well know about um, how far our inspections of mental health services actually ask the questions around how well they're contributing to the safeguarding of children as well. And, and that isn't labelling people with mental health problems, it's just saying there is a strong correlation between uh, the appropriateness of mental health services and uh, some safeguarding services for children as well. So I think we need to ensure this is embedded in all the work that we do, uh, not compartmentalise it to a team that is doing children's safeguarding inspections but that's, that would be a personal view that needs to be uh, opened up and I wouldn't want to preempt um, a conversation that I think we do need to have internally about how best to take that, that work forward. Steve, no. I mean I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, what now concerns me is um, is there <coughs> any additional risk between now and April 2015 if we aren't having joint inspections? No, I think this is, well, <laughs> is there additional risk? Uh, well, yes, there is additional risk. Just let's just speak as it is. Yes, there is additional risk. Um, and uh, we're mitigating that risk by being absolutely clear about this programme. Uh, and because Ofsted have deferred this till, uh, till 15, this is why we've got a two-year programme. It's not we're trying to fill a space, it's we're trying to discharge what our responsibilities are around um, and assuring that services for children, uh, particularly in relation to safeguarding and the special vulnerabilities that children looked after, um, um, there's a challenge in the system to make sure that amidst all the other things that are going on as systems are transforming, some attention is being paid to this particularly vulnerable group. Sorry, just the, the only other point I wanted to make, I mean, it, I think the, the effectiveness issue is, is really key, <coughs> and we need to just take account of the changing landscape, because obviously the GMC, the Royal Colleges, you know, the BMA, they're all getting involved in this space. Um, but also, I think the multi-agency approach has failed. It's failed disastrously, and it's become a barrier to the safety of children. So that's, you know, that's where I come from. And, and that's why when we look at the effects, I just want, I just would like us to sort of take that into account and consider how do we, how do we, how do we bridge, bridge things rather than make them even more disparate, you know? So that's exactly the debate we need to have, and that's why we were, uh, Camilla and myself said, let's sit down and work this out about where we go. One of the things I want to, to include in that debate is the deterrent effect of children's safeguarding inspections. It's not just the post hoc when you intervene after something's gone wrong, which is what we've had, but how far does uh, the, the um, 
in a sense, the anticipation that we're going to visit and ask questions, hard questions, about the robustness of uh, systems lead to a number of organisations taking action that they might not otherwise have taken. And I just think there is a, a reputational and deterrent issue that needs to be factored into the way that we work. I do, I, my personal belief, I have no evidence for it, is people do behave differently as a consequence of us saying we're going to do things. The uh, first question I got at the Foundation Trust Network con conference yesterday was about perverse incentives. So we can't have this always. <laughs> You know, if, uh, if people do what we ask, then actually there's merit in us asking about children safeguarding. And if a perverse incentive is that people safeguard children more effectively, I'm in for it. Yes, that's one of those things that isn't perverse. Yeah. 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 Thank um, you, Paul. Um, um, <laughs> so I, I just want to observe, kind of referencing back to some early discussions we had about the strategy at the, uh, of the organisation and the, the way we wanted to change our approach. And obviously a lot of that was around the inspection regime, but there was also an element of it, which was that we didn't, um, we didn't want simply to be recipients of kind of um, a, 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 a set of requirements on us. And if we, if we thought that things uh, were not as they should be, we, we would want to make that case. So sort of more active participants in the, um, the, 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 the policy space, I suppose. And I, 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 I don't know a great deal personally about this space, but in listening to the conversation, it sounds to me like actually um, there's, a, there's a question in our minds about whether um, uh, Ofsted have made the right decision or, or maybe we need to go it our, uh, alone separately. And, and I don't think we should just kind of sit and say, well, that's the decision they've made, so we've got to respond in, in this way, but rather give ourselves, afford ourselves the time and space to think about, well, what, what way do we think it ought to be? And then to uh, work with, um, with government and others to see if we can arrive at the right solution. Um, so I, if we think there's an issue, I think we should grasp it and, uh, uh, and try and uh, shape a response to it, is what I'm saying, rather than just deal with our own, our own house, if you like. That was a useful discussion, I think. David, are you going to take that away? And you're going to talk to Camilla and Steve and other, others here, and, and maybe Ofsted as well, actually, uh, and come back to the board with a, with a, with a considered view? Yeah. yeah. Well, just to reassure you, we have gone into this space with Ofsted. Um, and um, uh, I have made my views known about this. And um, the statement is that um, interagency inspections will commence again in 2015. Now, um, we need to check that and we'll continue to do that. I think this is a hugely important part of our responsibilities. Um, but let's have the debate. Let's have the discussion internally about where we are with it. And if, we, if you feel we've not filled a space in an appropriate way, then we'll fill the space. This isn't something uh, to sit back on. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Given that I'm taking this responsibility on, um, uh, I mean, I, I take this really seriously um, from a practicing GP's point of view, you know, in Birmingham. It, 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 and, and for many years, I carried around the Climbier report in my bag because it had such a profound effect on, uh, on me personally. Um, in the brief 10 days of induction to this, this role, I mean, it... it it's clear that we have a responsibility, and Ofsted doesn't, on inspection and regulation in the health service sector. Um, problems always happen um, in the handoff or interface between organisations. Uh, and certainly I'd be committed, and, and as we later on talk about the new structures that uh, to deliver, this will be an important part of, of my team's role, and we need to make sure we get it right. Uh, and I think Kimmel is absolutely right. There's a history of joint, in, joint work between all sorts of different agencies, which isn't as effective as it, it could be. We had a brief discussion with Ofsted yesterday, uh, uh, committed to working uh, very closely with them. But my understanding was, I think it was the Monroe report in 2011, mm. reinforced the need for joint inspections. The government came out very committed to making sure they happened. And we need to be in a leading role rather than passive in this. Any other issues on David's report? Okay. Yeah, just a quick one. That, um, uh, we won't be able to answer it now, but it's um, on, on the point three about our um, independence. 
that um, the Secretary of State has, has announced. Um, and there's been sort of various responses, um, but it, uh, sort of typical responses are that it's sort of tokenistic or, or more positively, it's symbolic. Um, and I just, at some point, it would be helpful for us to kind of talk through what it actually means. Because, you know, we're saying we're going to speak without fear or favour, we're going to speak truth to power, which is great. Um, but at the same time, we can't cam campaign. And I think it would be, you know, and I know we've got things like partnership agreements and MOUs in place and all that. And we need to make sure that we kind of implement them and scrutinise them and all that sort of thing. But, you know, particularly for, as well, the, the, the board and the directors as to what we can sort of reasonably say without you know, feeling that we're being inappropriate or, you know, because I think the public now do expect us to speak out, you know, but we ob obviously we can't campaign. So, um, you know, maybe part of the board development, that's something we could discuss a bit, a bit more. Um, but I'd certainly welcome some clarity on it so that we can be quite clear, you know, what, what this means for us as an organisation. Thanks. Can we pick that up at the next meeting? We'll have, it'll be clearer, I think, by then. I mean, I think the, the intention, I mean, he drew, he's drawn the two analogies, I think, one with the BBC and one with the Bank of England in terms of what is our independence. I mean, he does mean it to go beyond being tokenistic. Um, it is symbolic, um, but uh, he, he, he wants to be sure that, as he would have put it, never again would we not say, reveal, say the truth because it might be politically embarrassing. I mean that is that is his clear intention. But should we come back at the next meeting when it's been more when it's been, it'll be in the care bill by then anyway. Any and any other issues for David? Now Mike Mike is um, I'm really sorry. I mean this is this won't happen again. But, uh, it's just that Mike is chairman of the inspection team at Barking ha um, Havering and Redbridge, which is an important hospital to look at, and so I th we we felt it was right that he should be doing that. David, do you want to, yeah. I mean, everyone's got Mike's paper. I mean, other questions that people would like to raise that either David, Paul, or myself might, might answer? Paul. Um, this is just around the publication of the reports. It, it looks as if in November and December we're publishing four together. Or are we, bit, or are we publishing singly? Because it seems to me that I can understand that starting off, there's a, you know, there are, in a sense, it's got to stop being about us and start being about the trusts. The first lot may be about us. So public people are interested in, you know, this is a new thing, right? And I can understand doing four together about that. After that, I think they need to be published singly because they're about the trusts. Um, and uh, and that's and the, the focus needs to move away from us onto Barking and Havering, Havering or whatever. I think that's the plan. I think that's the plan. There has been this debate about should there be in a block or should there be individually, and I'm, I'm with you. Uh, if we've not settled that, then let's confirm that at the next meeting that that's our uh, intention to do that. And I think it, for exactly the reasons you've said, Paul. I think it's partly, Paul, that um, in the early days we want to get some comparability and some quality assurance across more than, and just one is probably not enough. But that's probably the reason why the four are coming out together. Uh, Paul, uh, other Paul, um, of the 18, I mean, we're, I think four will be published before Christmas, won't <coughs> def Four are being published now, aren't they, in the, in the next sort of three weeks. Well, how many more will come before Christmas? Uh, so we need, to, we need to do the work, see what we find, how long the actual on-site inspection takes for, for each of these before we firmly commit to how many. Uh, the intent is very much there to publish as many of the 18 as possible. My, my assumption is it's more likely to be around half of them, either eight or, okay. uh, or possibly pushing up to, to, to yeah. 12. Um, but let's, let, let's see what we find, and uh, let's also see the extent to which the, the trusts uh, have concerns about our findings. We do have a factual accuracy uh, point to bear in mind as well. Yeah. The, other, the other issue, Paul, is that I think Mike felt, I think rightly, that in terms of deciding which trusts were outstanding, which were good, that's quite a until you've got a number of reports, it's quite hard to get a balance for that. So I think the feeling is, is that although we will be publishing the reports, I think you're right, when they come out, we may not putting, be putting a rating until, I think, April, Paul. Is that right? Uh, so we'll do this in phases. We've committed to three of the trusts, um, Royal Surrey, Dartford and Gravesham, and Heart of England, FT, uh, to be rated on a pilot basis, very much on a learning basis. 
Um, uh, those will also be shadow ratings because of the um, we won't have the legal um, basis for uh, for the formal ratings for the second wave of acute trusts um, that we'll um, look to announce shortly. Uh, we would expect to rate all of those again in shadow form, uh, and those will be carried out between January and March. Uh, and once we're through into April, subject to the passage of the bill, uh, all trusts would then be uh, then be rated. Um, David, was there any fee feedback? Sorry, Anna, any feedback from the Foundation Trust Network about the inspections we've done so far? Any, or Paul, you were there yesterday as well. Any? Uh, no direct yeah. feedback. I mean, I think people are keen to understand our plans. Uh, um, I think the pleas that were underway. I think the Foundation Trust Network has been particularly supportive, and the feedback from presentation uh, that I did to them yesterday was um, was positive so I think it's all those cases it's um, it's when the theory of it becomes applied to the institution that you run where um, he goes from uh, the kind of intellectual and rational understanding of this to a slightly more visceral and emotional understanding um, and it's exactly on this issue about ratings about people feeling that we're going to judge them and um, that's a big deal for these organizations no matter how confident they are and um, so I think there's a mixture of uh, appreciation and support for the direction we're moving in. I think these bigger expanded teams with clinicians, uh, experts by experience, spending longer speaking to people about their experiences, spending longer speaking to staff, people absolutely get that and welcome that. Um, but by the same token, um, I think there is an anxiety about what will this mean for us. Um, so it's a mixture, I think, to be brutally honest. Sorry, so um, as, as some, some, some people uh, around the table know, we had a, a, a meeting with Ofsted last night, um, uh, which was extremely interesting in terms of some of the things they, they, they do. But one in particular thing that I'd just like to put on the table more formally, which was um, I hadn't realised, but that they, uh, um, at the end of the inspection, will write a report for um, children in the school. Um, uh, which seems to me to be an enormously uh, uh, important thing to do, not least because what it does is focuses the mind on what the key messages are um, to uh, users of the service. Um, and I, I'd just like to ask that we give some thought to whether we could do the same in respect of, um, I mean, if we possibly could, the very first inspection reports, and I know that's a tall order because we're well down the path in that respect, but I think beginning that process would be great. And I, I, I think one way, one way to think about this would be um, that we know that when people are involved in these kinds of processes, and we have involved many more ordinary people who are users of service in the early stage, and I think you were at a public meeting, David, last night for the uh, Barking and Havering uh, um, inspection. So, so a lot of people have been drawn together, including through Local Health Watch and elsewhere, to um, get, become involved in these inspections. And what's really important to people who do give up their time to do that is that they get direct feedback. So thinking about a report to the users of service as a way of, of, of giving something back to the people who've involved themselves and given up their time, I think, is quite a, a, a good way to, to, to start framing it. I think and that very much struck, I think it struck us all, didn't it, last night? That was a really a good thing to do. Lewis? Yes, well, the, the other thing that the Ofsted people said last night, it was a very interesting conversation, that, that was, um, I must say, I was struck most by their... Um, one of the things they do when they are awarding outstanding ratings, which is that they will not, as if I understood correctly, they won't uh, issue a, a, a rating of outstanding um, to um, uh, schools which are unable to demonstrate benefits to a particularly vulnerable group of pupils. And in this case, uh, their example, it was um, uh, children who were uh, getting free lunches, free, free meals. Um, I, I raised this question with them in relation to people who are vulnerable in the health system, who include people with mental illness, learning disability and dementia. Uh, and it seemed to me to be a very good uh, way, a model that they had developed, where if you cannot show that you are doing the right thing by the people who are most vulnerable, then you cannot be outstanding. And by implication, uh, if you can, um, then that probably means that you're doing pretty well for most other patient groups as well. So um, I just, uh, it, it is, as I was saying, it is quite early. I realise that that wouldn't be in the system yet, but can we just not lose that point that that might be something that we'd want to introduce across uh, our ratings too? I think, I think on the free meals, it was actually the people who attract pupil, the pupil premium, I think, which is, but it's, anyway, it's a, it's a very good point, Lewis. Yeah. Okay. Any other, Steve? Um, I think the more practical point. Oh, sorry. I keep forgetting. Uh, more practical point. On the um, requirement for monitor and the um, 
National Trust Development Authority to um, process um, acute trusts that are seeking foundation trust status. Is that going to con um, give us some congestion um, in the um, inspections? Um, no, we're trying not to do that, but um, one of the key issues from monitoring the TDA's point of view is that they've got a number of um, applicants in the pipeline that are community and mental health trusts. Uh, so um, the congestion has really been about whether the model that we've got for inspecting community and mental health trusts is good to go. So this is where in um, paragraphs eight onwards, I think, Steve, um, we've talked about um, the hothouse events that we've held to accelerate the development of the model and um, the timetabling of the availability of um, the Mental Health and Community Trust that um, we've talked about being ready for that post-Christmas period is so that there's no uh, nothing uh, backing up. Um, the narrative out there is that um, the pipeline's blocked because we've not done our approach um, around how we're going to assess community and mental health trust. So we'll put that right. I think um, um, some of them won't get through, not because we haven't got our approach right, because they're not good enough to go. But actually, the only way to expose that is for us to get our methodology out and get that. So um, that's what we've been working on. As I say, we've had what we've called a couple of hot houses where literally people have gone away for a full day and really not come out until they've really worked through the issues uh, and just accelerated the way the learning that we've been able to do. So. Um, that's gone well and we've made good progress from that and um, so I feel that we're not going to be um, backing these up but but clearly monitor in particular looking for assurance from us that we've done a full and effective inspection of those services and our judgment about quality is based on a robust approach uh, and that means we need to apply our new methodology to inspecting these services. We've got that methodology for acute and um, we're in the process of finalising that methodology for mental health and community services. Um, sorry, I have another point, but the, um, the, in the report, and it may be that you don't know exactly what Mike was meant in his report, but there's a line in it which struck me and that, that was where he says that um, the Wave 1 inspections are being used to test the feasibility of rating individual services against the five domains, which is obviously key to our future strategy, not just in acute hospitals, but across the entire uh, um, sort of health system. Um, and then he says, this is proving challenging. Um, and challenging is one of those sort of yes minister words, uh, which could mean anything um, uh, from slightly uh, difficult down to utterly impossible. And uh, I just wonder whether you know what he means by that. I think it's up there. Uh, ten years in the department, Lewis has obviously <laughs> gone to good use. But um, I think this is down. That this is difficult. So what this is saying is, do we say outstanding, good, uh, requires improvement, uh, inadequate, against each of the five safe, effective, etc.? And it plays a little bit to the point you were making about what weight to give things, and what's the gearing that's driven in the way that we arrive at those. So your point about Ofsted won't give. And outstanding unless um, children on the pupil premium are being dealt with properly. We'll have similar issues uh, around, well, to be safe and outstanding, what's the threshold between good? And because of the issues about what's in safe and what's in well led, for instance, um, what's the barrier between those as well? So I think. Conceptually, it's easy. You just rate each of those five domains. When you uh, come at it technically about what are the domain boundaries, uh, what are the criteria for each domain, uh, it's difficult. Uh, we're not using the word challenging, saying it's impossible. Um, but we are saying that there actually are some pretty ish important issues about definitions, and particularly on each of the thresholds. Um, so what's the difference between good and outstanding? What's the di difference between, and this will be the key one, I think, requires improvement and outstanding? Uh, good, yeah, sorry. So one of the issues um, is going to be, could you have staff working very hard and being very committed without good leadership? We're going to go into hospitals where leadership is an issue, and we're going to see staff working very hard. How do we call that? Could you be a good hospital if you've got poor leadership? 
It's a really interesting issue. And uh, so that's what's sat behind that. How do we get to the threshold? And if you look at uh, Ofsted's uh, grade criteria, they lay this out pretty clearly. And in our consultation document early in the summer, we did. But we did it um, um, not for each of the five domains. We actually did it for the general descriptors of safe, effective, etc. for an institution rather than looking at whether we can do it across each of the domains. So there's more work to be done, which is why... Uh, we're piloting this. So whilst we'll publish three uh, ratings, uh, and they'll be in December, and Paul's run through the hospitals that will do that on, or the trusts that will do it on, um, we're actually looking at how we'll apply this on each of the 14 inspections, because we need to uh, you know, run it as a live test. So when they get to the end of Barking and Havering tomorrow, um, one of the conversations they'll have once they've arrived at their assessment and their judgment of services is if we were running a rating, what would this translate into? Uh, so that's something. Yes. As David said, there, there's a whole range of reasons put behind the challenging piece. The, the, just to add two more, um, in some areas there are very good standards. So the question is, do we have enough evidence to understand whether... Uh, a trust is at the appropriate standard for its maternity care, for example. Um, in other areas, we are, we're, we're working as we go, and we're using people like the King's Fund and uh, Michael West on our whole leadership agenda so that we have clear standards that we can inspect against on well-led. It's going to be difficult to uh, assess uh, a particular service's well-ledness while we're developing that framework. That's, uh, that's one issue we're, we're aware of. Uh, the other one, there are certain services where it's quite difficult to simply define what, um, for some domains, what the, uh, the answer would be. So in A&E, what, what a clinically effective A&E service is, is quite difficult because of the, uh, the, the play through the rest of the hospital, the importance of the consultants that aren't working in A&E but uh, clearly take ownership of, the, of, of patients who are admitted. So the, the, the point that we need to hold on to throughout this, this is a learning process for us at the same time as being a regulatory process. That's why it's challenging. Paul, you mentioned Michael West, that, who's doing this work at the King's Fund for us on this well-led domain. I think it will be really helpful. I don't know, he's, they must be getting quite near the end of doing that work now, whether when it's done or before it's set in concrete, rather. Maybe he, you or, or he might come to one of our meetings here and just lay out what, what his thinking is on that. Would that be all right? Uh, yes, absolutely. So on the time scale of that, he's, um, it's a two-phase piece of work uh, going up to Christmas. The first phase is to get the conceptual framework right, um, and the, effectively the lockdown step for that is the 22nd of October. Um, so we've had uh, sight of the, the framework. We have one more sort of big event to test if there are any significant concerns. Um, and as part of that work, working closely with TDA and Monitor, so we have a single uh, approach to quality governance. Uh, then the task becomes to make sure that it's um, not just an interesting concept, it's actually something we can use on our inspections, which is what they need to deliver for us by, um, by the end of December. But yes, absolutely. Um, good. Yeah, uh, last, last question. Kay, yeah. Um, it's it's, it's uh, a, a bit different. And, um, and what, at some point, I would um, like to be able to kind of describe um, what sort of user patient public involvement in inspections is like. Because, I mean, it's, it's good that we can give people a copy of the report and we have um, experts by experience um, on the inspection teams. But it strikes me that there could be some, or there should be some very um, strong involvement and influence in the ratings, for example. Um, so, but at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to kind of um, speak authoritatively in saying this is what involvement of pa patients, pe people is in, in inspections. And I know it's developing, but I think it's, you know, it's more than just having someone around the table and giving people reports. So it's just to make that. I, and also I had another a point, which was um, a plea, really, not to forget um, learning disability services. Um, because um, whilst most services for people with learning disability are in the community, there are some people in hospitals. And that's going to fall across the two chief inspectors. And I know, again, I know it's early days, um, but the people in hospitals are particularly vulnerable. Um, and it's something that we kind of, re and, and obviously it relates to Winterbourne, obviously, um, but it's something that we kind of really need to sort of get, get to grips with. Okay, on the first point, we asked Mike for the next meeting to 
address that issue about the user involvement in the, and on learning disabilities. I'm sure Steve has noted that as well. Thanks very much. Um, um, Andrea, you're next on. Um, this is your first meeting, Andrea, and, and you started off with a with a bang yesterday. Um, <laughs> Perhaps you just tell us how that went to start with. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, you have a report um, uh, in front of you, which is incredibly short, and I can't promise to make it one side long in the future, um, but I did write it on the afternoon of my first day, um, which was last week, and it probably took me longer to write the template cover um, uh, than it did to write the paper. Um, as you quite rightly say, um, uh, uh, David, um, we launched the um, a fresh start for the inspection and regulation of adult social care document yesterday and although that was um, only in my second week it was the product of an awful lot of work that had gone on beforehand um, and I'm really grateful to Paul and his team particularly Rachel Dodgson and Jill Morell for their help in all of that. Um, <clears throat> You've had the content shared with you already, um, and it sets out how adult social care fits in to the overall strategy, the key priorities going forward, how we're actually going to engage with people on the various discussions um, to put it all into place. In terms of response, um, I kind of break it down into three areas, uh, the media, the public and, and the sector. So in terms of the, uh, the media, um, I think you know, Chris Day and his team played a blinder um, in terms of supporting um, uh, as having some very extensive and positive coverage um, uh, 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 about the issues that we were raising. An awful lot of it um, focused on the issue of um, uh, hidden cameras, mystery shopping. Um, which in a way, although it kind of took a prominence, which I think um, it doesn't really have in the document, um, it did enable us um, to um, actually get the, um, uh, the airtime to extend the debate and the discussion into issues about adult social care quality, the role of the Care Quality Commission. Um, so I think you know, it was important from that, and it is an issue that people have raised with us. Um, and as I said to many people who asked me yesterday, we don't want to duck it. We do want to have the conversation. Um, secondly, the public. Um, so reflecting on the calls that we had through to the contact centre um, yesterday and also um, the reaction on Twitter um, and, and elsewhere. Um, so people have come forward really um, enthused, I think, um, by the uh, proposal to expand um, the involvement of experts by experience and lots of people suggesting that they would want to, um, to do that and, and that's, um, uh, that's really encouraging, I think in terms of uh, as wanting to take that forward. Um, an awful lot of people sharing their views on hidden cameras, as we might imagine, given the way that the, um, uh, the media coverage went. And what I take from that is it makes it very clear as to why we need to have the debate, um, because there are extremely wide-ranging views. Um, those who kind of think that we should be doing it yesterday um, and everywhere and all the time, um, all the way through to those um, who kind of think that this is a big brother approach and we shouldn't be contemplating it at all. Um, I think where I am is that we need to be considering um, the, uh, the, the rights for privacy and dignity of the people who um, uh, are receiving services, and we have to absolutely be clear um, uh, 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 about that. Um, but I think that it's really good that people are engaging. And we've also had some very specific questions about other aspects of the document um, uh, uh, as well. In terms of the sector, um, we've had really a, an encouraging response. Um, uh, so um, across the providers, who of course um, will be um, kind of at the sharp end uh, of all of this, um, a really positive response. And and I think you know, kind of just reflecting upon what David said a few moments ago about it's all well and good in the con conceptual framework that this is the way that we want to do it, but eventually it'll happen to me. And, and what will I think then? Um, I'm in that honeymoon period of people. Thinking thinking, yes, we want a strong and robust and tough regulator who sets, um, uh, sets out what they're going to do and how they're going to do that, and that's very welcome. Um, so let's kind of go with that for the time being um, um, and, and work with them um, to make that a reality. Um, Sandy Keane, on behalf of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, um, uh, was very positive, um, and other national partners have kind of offered their help in the variety of different ways that we want to take it forward. But although 
my kind of first week has been utterly dominated by trying to get this um, uh, uh, landed and, and, and out there. You know, really the real work starts now. Um, and it's all about the engagement, having those kind of proactive discussions with people and moving that forward, designing um, the new um, uh, uh, regulation and inspection approach and preparing for the consultation which will take place next spring. Um, so you can expect regular updates, I'm sure, in, uh, until then. Thanks, um, Andrew. Did, what was the sort of general feedback on the, your, the My Mum test? Um, again, uh, uh, people, I think, kind of really get it um, and that it's the it's kind of um, putting somebody somebody described it as putting humanity um, into what we do as uh, as inspectors and regulators which frankly is kind of what I was trying to get across so that's that's great so people have 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 been uh, have been positive about that the challenge I think is you know, that by saying my mum and given the age I am um, it's obviously I'm, I'm talking about somebody who's over 65 um, and that adult social care is not just about um, uh, uh, elderly people um, although obviously a huge majority of the services um, are focused there so so I have extended it to say my mum or any other relevant member of my family um, to reflect the fact that actually it could be somebody who is a young person with a mental health problem or a physical disability or whatever uh, it may be and uh, and again I think that that resonates with people that actually this is about people um, and it's about their whole lives and that's what we should be thinking about um, I mean I um, obviously saw a lot of the um, feedback and reaction and it was overwhelmingly positive you know people there's lots of goodwill people want us want Andrea to, to succeed and I appreciate it is a honeymoon period and there will be inevitably sort of things down the line which we'll have to manage and and, and um, face up to etc um, and I mean, on a personal note, I was very kind of pleased to see the commitment to an increase in experts by experience and a commitment to um, co-production as well, which is um, really important for a lot of people who use social care services. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the five uh, priorities uh, and one which particularly interests me, um, which I lobbied for a couple of years ago and didn't get anywhere with, which is the developing an approach to monitoring the finances of some adult social care providers. Uh, and whether you, I know it's very early days, but if you have any thoughts about how you're going to develop that capability, is it possible for you to share those with us now? Um, I'm going to uh, um, uh, claim the it's very early days um, line, um, but also to say that um, it's part of um, the care bill as it's going through um, uh, Parliament at the moment. So we're not going to have those um, powers and responsibility <coughs> until the care bill um, uh, gets royal assent sometime next year, and that'll come into place for um, April 2015. Uh, so, however, as I know from discussing um, with the team here, you know, April 2015 will come round very, very quickly. So we are working um, uh, both internally and with the Department of Health around um, what the regulations may need to say, because actually it's going to the, the detail of that is going to be really important, um, and the Department will um, consult on the regulations um, in due course. Um, secondly, in terms of capacity, um, this is something new for the Care Quality Commission, and, and I think that we have to think very carefully about what it is that we're going to need to do um, how we're going to need to do it and what are the skills and experience of the people um, uh, who need to be kind of working with us on this and we probably don't have all of that those skills and experience within the organization at the moment so we're going to have to think about how we build that in to the new structure um, as we're going forward and the final thing to say is that our our focus will be on the larger providers the 50 to 60 we reckon um, larger providers and um, you know to be honest a lot of them are already kind of doing work about the information that they've got I mean they've got boards that they're reporting to which um, will be receiving information so one of the things that I want to be able to do is to have conversations with some of them about what it is that they're already doing and how can we make sure um, that we're not adding um, a huge um, uh, uh, burden but actually skimming off you know um, the sensible and useful information that they already have um, and you know after yesterday I've already had a few of them um, 
um, kind of suggesting that they'd like to come and have the same conversation with me too. So um, uh, we'll take it forward. So I'm sorry not to give you detail, but it's certainly um, certainly something that both me and uh, members of Paul's, Paul's team are very mindful of. And just to make the point that the issue is um, on, on this is uh, this is the poor Southern Cross question about how do we assess financial resilience and robustness of organisations. And um, we, in effect, become the um, service continuity regime for adult social care. So, um, so just to reinforce Andrea's point, I do not believe we've got the business analytical skills that are required. These are not economic skills. It's business, it, it, uh, it's organisational fail, financial failure skills that we require. So it's more likely to be in McKinsey's, PwC, um, the organisations that do insolvency regimes, etc. So this is a, a finance and quality insolvency regime. Well, I, I just want to say, um, oh, well, well done, really, and, and how, how good it is to see this part of our agenda getting such wide um, publicity so early in the game, in, in your time, really, um, uh, Andrea, because I, I, I think there's a, a, a real and understandable sense um, in which people might have um, been forgiven for thinking that the CQC had become the Hospital Care Commission, rather than the uh, the, the, than, than, than having a, a kind of a, a, a much broader agenda, and I think it will be um, hugely important that that as you're developing the social care um, uh, uh, arrangements, that that you know, and Mike is publishing his first reports on hospitals, that we keep these two things very much in the public eye uh, uh, to give people confidence that we're not just focused on one part of our work, but on the the whole spectrum. So. So, so I think it's, it's, it's great that you've got something out there for discussion so, so quickly, and I just think it will be really important in your conversations going forward to make sure that there are a series of points at which you keep this kind of out there in the, um, in, in the public mind to show um, uh, that, that we're, we're, we're moving it forward. Um, well, thank you, um, uh, Anna, for that. I mean, you can be absolutely guaranteed that <laughs> um, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, and, uh, and I think that the way that we've set out um, the process of engagement and co-production with people um, who are both using services and concerned about the services um, that are being delivered in ad adult social care will give us a lot of opportunity um, to keep that in the public domain. And I, and I do also think that the relationship between... Um, the Care Quality Commission, Health Watch England and individual health watches is going to be really important in terms of keeping that going um, as well. So, um, so I think that there's you know, the, the goodwill to build on, um, as, as Kay kindly um, uh, uh, mentioned, and, and the expectation um, that we will do that as well, which I think that we kind of have to deliver on. But, you know, I'm expecting you know, support from other bits of the organisation and I have to say that I am absolutely getting that support and, and that will help in terms of us being able to do it. Thank you very much, Andrea. Well, Steve, the third Chief Inspector, welcome to the, your first board meeting. Thank you. And um, your paper is even shorter than Andrea's. Uh, yes, I was asked to give an oral report. <laughs> so, I, I, um, so I will if that's, uh, uh, that's okay. So uh, in the... Uh, first few days here, um, I've genuinely been hugely impressed by the support uh, that I've uh, been given for um, being hired to set out uh, to support and lead on a series of uh, areas of which general practice has had the prominence, but actually there are equally important areas within the portfolio. And I thought what I'd do is just outline some of the areas and then um, just say where we are. This is very very, uh, these are very, very early days. General practice um, is, is a new area. We've started in CQC some visits already, which we'll use um, as, uh, for learning in order to build a new system. But in, in general practice, there are over 7,300 uh, GP practices and even more sites uh, across England. Um, in dentistry, we're up in the 10,000s. Um, and so we're, there's a lot of sites scattered around England that we will need to have a new system. And a lot of the time in the last few days has been working with Hillary and others trying to put together a, a system for inspection so that we can bring proposals to the board um, so that we can move forward and working with Paul looking at the intelligence part of this. So 
Um, for both general practice and dentistry, we have a surveillance and inspection regime. The lessons from dentistry already are that um, dental care is pretty good across England, and um, in fact, the visits we've had have been very well received. Um, but in general practice, we've only just started, and uh, our commitment is to a two-year rolling program to visit every GP surgery uh, in England over that time. And we're putting together some ideas. Uh, my uh, current thinking, uh, because I think it's worth just sharing it, is that we look at um, the CCG, uh, Clinical Commissioning Group areas, and sample practices over that two-year period um, so that we can start to build in some more themed reviews uh, across that geographical area. Uh, as a practicing GP, I'm particularly interested in the interface between organizations. We mentioned earlier on children's safeguarding, but out of hours and emergency care is really uh, important. Um, uh, we will look at an early stage uh, to work with uh, Andrea uh, to look at medication uh, prescribing and provisioning care homes, which um, it has been a problem for a, a long time now, uh, not just in health but in the social care aspects uh, uh, of that, which will improve safety but also uh, should reduce admissions to hospital, which I think is a really important area. It's something which hasn't systematically been reviewed uh, and looked at. Um, the idea would be that we go into uh, clinical commissioning groups. We work very closely with the local health watch so that we can have a lot of uh, patient and potential patient public involvement. But we would have a general practitioner on each visit, which I think is a, is a key way of looking at what's really happening in, in general practice um, with some uh, a really good inspector leading that. But I would also like involvement uh, of nurses and, and trainees in general practice. So we're building up a model so that it can be priced, so that we can start to recruit so that we can uh, really move on this in April of next year. Um, the other areas that I'm responsible for, uh, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, are the children's safeguarding agenda, which again, as a GP in an inner city, uh, I've been on uh, and in the middle of uh, issues between different agencies, which I think if we take a leadership role in there on health, we can help uh, resolve some of those issues. Uh, something which will increase over the next year or two is the health and justice uh, area as well, which I know Lewis is an expert on in prisons and secure environments, uh, uh, as well as the pharmacy area of controlled drugs and medications. But I think one of the big areas which um, is, is really exciting is this around themed um, reviews and integration. Uh, and that will mean working very, very closely with Andrea and Mike as the other two uh, chief inspectors to try and look at what would be good, uh, what is good, what is not working and shine a spotlight on that and encourage the health service to move into a much more collaborative and an integrated way. Um, a lot of work needs to be done looking at the surveillance areas on ratings as well as the model of inspection. Uh, but in the uh, last few days, we've worked uh, long and hard to start that work. So um, uh, I apologise for not having a written report, but it's changing every few hours at the moment and um, uh, hugely exciting. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, Michael, you've had, had the three reports from the three chief inspectors. Any sort of observations? Well, they <coughs> had to press your button. Like everybody else around the table, I've been very impressed by um, Andrea's, I don't know if performance is quite the right word, yesterday. Um, but I, I think it was excellent both for uh, adult social care itself, but also for the CQC more generally. I, I think um, uh, it really was excellent. And I've said also to Andrea, I thought the signposting document was a model of its kind because it was extremely well structured, it was very clear, uh, there were no ambiguities, you knew exactly um, uh, how adult social care was going to be tackled at least um, at this stage. I think the, uh, like other colleagues um, who were at the dinner last night, I was very impressed by 
Ofsted, um, including particularly impressed by Lorraine's sort of operational description of uh, aspects of Ofsted, and I think two in particular, which I think are relevant to the three inspectors' reports. I think it's um, th these letters which go to, and I, I was just on my flicking through my iPad, finding and just reading a few just now, they are really very um, impressive. And they're even sent to uh, children in primary schools. So, um, and they're written in a way which isn't condescending um, and gets the points across very clearly. Now, it, it may be that the equivalent of the letters for CQC are to patients, but I also wonder whether they should be to all staff in a hospital that have been inspected in the case of hospitals. Because I think there's one thing writing a report, sort of an official report. There's another thing, I, I think writing an in, a letter to each of these individuals um, could be very powerful and more powerful than publishing a report on the website and hoping that people read them. So I think there may actually be two kinds of CQC letter, one to everybody who works in a hospital and, and one to um, patient and, and um, other people who've been involved in providing information. The second point I was very taken with is the, I, I don't know whether they overdid the sophistication of the way they diagnose the performance of inspectors. But I thought that was very impressive mm -hmm. too. I say it may have been rather over, um, it might have been exaggerated in the sense that I'm not quite sure these algorithms are as complicated as um, they made out yesterday. But I do think it's, um, it is, it's very important for the chief inspectors and for this board to be very confident about the quality of the inspectors that CQC uh, recruits and deploys. And I, I don't know enough about um, performance management at CQC at the moment, but I would have thought something like the Ofsted methodology, if it's not already at CQC, um, is very, uh, very much worth thinking about. And incidentally, one other point. Um, I happened to be sitting next to, as people saw, Rachel D'Souza, the um, former head teacher and now the uh, chief executive of this um, Inspiration Trust in Norfolk. And I, um, I have to say that she was extremely complimentary about our chairman. So, um, <laughs> no, my <laughs> Uh, thank you for those two points, and the third point as well, but um, let's, uh, any other questions? Uh, Lewis. Um, uh, this is a question for Steve, actually. The, um, the, there's likely to be an issue about the availability of data, um, thinking of the surveillance model, and I just wanted to get your early impression on this. And the, the, um, the, the, the difficulty that we will face, that there's a history in the health service of starting off with quite noble sort of motives on, and intentions on what might, questions might be asked, mm. and then discovering that only a certain number of uh, items uh, have led to data collection. Certain number, there's only data on a certain number of things. And therefore, looking at the answers, and then from the answers, determining what questions might reasonably be put. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's gone on for years in the health service. And as a result, we haven't really had answers to the questions that really matter, or at least in some cases. Um, so in, in primary care, this might well be a particular problem. I suppose there'll be good data on elements of the COAF, I suppose, information where uh, you know, the information's had to be collected for contractual purposes or something else like that. But where we go beyond that, um, my fear is it might be quite difficult. So into areas that we're talking about in relation to hospitals like um, complaints and compliments, uh, patient satisfaction, patient commentary, those kind of things. 
uh, I just want to get your impression as to what extent, to what extent that, that information is somewhere in there waiting to be brought out. Because if it needs to be collected anew, that is, a, as you know, that is a yeah. whole rigmarole through the health service and very difficult nowadays yeah. to, to achieve. I think we'd, as general practitioners, we'd say we're drowning in data, but um, it's how you use it and how you present it which is important, and particularly how uh, patients and the public have access to information. Um, for example, um, all pathology requests in England are collected and can be analysed on one system, yet um, we know there's huge variation between the number of tests which are done and the appropriate of tests. If, if Mike Richards was here, he'd talk about um, some of the cancer indicators, which uh, in some surgeries are, are not done uh, at all, and in others are done very, very frequently. And just publishing information which is important will have two effects. Uh, one, the professionalism of doctors uh, will want to improve or look at why they're overdoing or underdoing things, so there's an issue there. Uh, but also if you then move to the packed data for prescribing and trying to understand and interrogate that. But COAF is, has become, in my, my view, over-bureaucratic, and a lot of the information there is not relevant um, to looking at performance. So what I'm looking uh, forward to is working with Paul and his teams on looking at what's important, working with NHS England as well on what they're going to publish. So there's a transparency agenda. And then there's what's appropriate in order to judge. And the judgment and the ratings in general practice, I think, are going to be really, really important. Uh, again, about what is a practice that needs improvement, but uh, as well, what's outstanding and what can people aspire to. So that's a really, really key piece of work. In the last few days, we've been looking at um, setting up teams in order to do some of that work. So we're, we're, we're very, very early in this, but we've got until April, which isn't that long, actually, but you're absolutely right. Paul, Paul. So to cite the board on, on, on a couple of the big challenges for, for us, which we're going to work on around the standard setting piece. So there's a, there's a really big open question, I think, as, as to what the standard should be for general practice. And it's, I mean, it's been knocking around for years, um, with COF being some sort of proxy. Um, but we need to be, to Anna's earlier point, and absolutely the heart of this national policy debate as to what is a reasonable expectation of general practice in the 21st century. Um, for example, are we, would we use a marker like the um, uh, avoidable admissions uh, to hospital as a proxy of, the, of, of general practice care? Uh, people have a range of different views about that, but that is a potentially hard metric that's currently not used, um, but might be. The other. I think really interesting part is the technical and technological changes that are happening around the ability to extract general practice data, what they call the GP extraction service that's run from the information centre because of its ability to link to secondary care outcomes. So without getting too techy about it, the idea of actually knowing how patients fared in terms of what was uh, done in general practice and linking that through to Secondary care is both important from an integration perspective, but it's also very important in understanding what the quality of the care uh, the patients got in their, in their primary uh, medical service. Um, that will be available uh, by the middle of next year. So we've got to go on a journey where we don't wait for these big technical ch uh, changes, but we're also pretty cognizant that that could uh, significantly change our ability to understand quality in general practice. Um, I'm quite interested in um, what kind of well-led might mean in general practice. Um, and I, I don't have any evidence to support this, of course, but it seems to me that, that often GP surgeries practices are well-managed, but not necessarily well-led. Because, um, you know, when I speak to GPs, which isn't an awful lot, <laughs> that they, they tend to sort of suggest that they're being done too, you know. So they're managing their practice, but there's stuff coming from elsewhere, everywhere else. And they so they, they feel kind of disempowered. And, and, and I just wondered, um, you know, as we're thinking ahead, you know, what we might look at in terms of what's well-led, you know, with a view to actually, I suppose, in a way, helping to transform how GP surgeries, GP practices, CCGs work, and whether you had any kind of early 
thoughts on that, whether I'm just talking a load of rubbish. But <laughs> Uh, no, there, there, I mean, there is an issue about management and leadership in practices. and um, But also, I think uh, we'd acknowledge as GPs that um, it is very, very difficult. I mean, there is one, there is a contract at the moment, and that is an issue as well over um, how flexible that contract is, whether the quality and outcomes framework has led to a deprofessionalizing of, of some of uh, our work um, because it's become more tick box but obviously the contract negotiations are not part of what we are uh, involved in at all. Um, there's a consensus, I think, that um, there needs to be more capacity in, in general practice and primary care, and there is a movement towards more federations of practices uh, and larger groupings of practices um, uh, around England, and, and with that you'll have a different leadership model as well. So it's, it's a lot of the work we've got to do in the next um, two months, but I think your reflection is, um, is one that we all uh, pick up. Um, but when you actually go into many practices, and, I, and I've been into lots and lots of practices, you find some fantastic leadership in practices. Um, you also find a lot of frustration. And um, if you were to look at um, an example of an extremely well-led practice, Vitality, which is a group of um, six or seven practices in the West Midlands. They have a different leadership model now that the practices have worked together. If you go to London and look at um, Claire Gerarda's practice, um, the Hurley practice, they've got a hundred or so salaried doctors. They have um, a very different leadership style. Uh, and um, so I think one of the things which is really exciting about this is demonstrating what's outstanding and I think another lesson, uh, as Michael was saying, from Ofsted is that I think we have a responsibility to use our website and our um, press contacts to uh, say what's good. Um, but we've got to define what's good first, which is, which is Paul's point. This is, this, this is such an obvious area to work in, but we haven't yet got some of the basics right on standards and on what patients should expect. Most patients don't know what good is and also there's a great loyalty of uh, patients to practices uh, even if things have gone wrong and so it's not simply transparency and publishing data it's uh, it's much more complex than that there's a there's a real human level thing there both on the practitioner and the patient's uh, part but it's exciting that's the important thing we can we can do something really important here can i just offer three brief disconnected thoughts um, one is obviously following up on what Paul said I mean presumably one of the things we want to rate people on is, what is the extent to which they will share medical records and that's in both primary and secondary care because if you if you go up to North West London to the Royal Free mm. the GPs there basically push the consultants to you know orchestrate a proper system where they can share information if you go to Salford it's actually the other way around it's the hospital pushing the GPs to do it. But I mean, that's quite a, for, for patients who want yeah. their medical records to follow them around, that's a kind of basic uh, thing we should look at, isn't it? Um, just a second disconnected thought. I was just thinking about my own children and back to what you said about safeguarding. And when you, I've got three primary age children. Mm. When you have a child on the NHS today, you get a thing called the Red Book. Mm -hmm. And the Red Book has all this, you know, it's, it says what vaccinations you should get, and it, it has, um, it sets out intervals at which your child should be examined. And none of my children has ever had any of those examinations. And whenever I've asked the GP, you know, I think it's 18 months and three years, you know, perfectly sensible stages, which is exactly what they do in France. GP looks astonished and says, well, no, we, we, don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, question, is that true? You know, is that something that is no longer done, or should it be done? And back to the safeguarding point, I mean, I know this sounds very basic, but... When you take a child to the doctor in France, the, the child is examined and their clothes are taken off and they're examined. And that one single thing would do more for safeguarding children in some of the terrible cases we've read about, I think, than any other thing. In so many of the serious case reviews, what we've seen is that the injuries were missed because for some reason in this country, GPs do not routinely examine children with, that, with their clothes off. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a small, but I think actually quite fundamental point and then the last point which is slightly more cheerful is I don't know <laughs> if you've um, talked to Tom Hughes Hallett who's just finished his commission in Essex looking at how to integrate health and social care and it's really worth actually just having a look at his report but he they went out they got a panel of a hundred people in Essex 
and they spent a day with them and they said, right, if you had the budget, the three billion budget, what would you do with it? And one of the, one of the astonishing things is that everybody said they would move the money away from GPs and towards pharmacists because they found the pharmacists were far more responsive and far more useful to them than the GPs were. So I just leave you with that. I thought it was just quite an intriguing thought about the way that the public are now seeing the role of the GP in relation to the role of the pharmacy. I, I get the theme now. Um, uh, this is really good. And I love that. The, I, I think the challenge is, is really, really important. So um, just briefly, uh, on shared records, when I led the Future Forum, um, we had a whole report on um, records and access and communication. My belief is that the patient should have access to their own record. Yeah, okay. um, uh, again, uh, an outstanding practice would be Amir Hanan's practice. He's the young GP who took over from Shipman when Shipman was convicted, and, and um, he uh, has over 60% of his patients regularly access their own records. Mm -hmm. And he has examples of patients admitted to hospital where they couldn't access any records or know about the patient, and the patient gave the doctors access through their dongle and access to the, the computer system and probably saved at least one life. Yeah. Um, there are two aspects to that. One is the techie aspect to it. Government is committed, because they agreed with our Future Forum recommendation, that um, patients should have access to the records mm. by, I think it was um, 2015, something like that. Um, I, I, I'm committed to that, and I think that should be something which is uh, an outstanding criteria, personally. Um, uh, our own practice is not at that level yet, but we've just changed our computer system in order to push it next year. So I think we should, we should be setting the tone for that. But it's also connectivity with hospitals. Mm -hmm. And there's an attitudinal thing around confidentiality. Yes, yes. And in a way, being paternalistic, um, the patients should understand the benefits and we should have an adult conversation with them uh, rather than pushing our own views Re regarding what gps do in their day-to-day -day lives with children um you know that's a professionalism issue and we can talk about that outside here but um uh, pharmacists just to finish pharmacists and nurses are, are at the moment two of my um categories of nhs worker which are right at the top of the agenda First of all, if I was putting money into reform in the NHS at the moment, uh, and given that most cost and most benefit comes from the workers in the NHS, uh, workforce reform, I would look at practice nursing and community nursing. We're not training enough practice and community nurses, and in some areas they don't talk to each other. The systems don't work. Mm. And so uh, if we seriously want to move care out of hospitals, top of my agenda would be how you use nurses on long-term conditions and managing guideline-based health care. So right at the top of the agenda. And I don't think we as CQC should shy away from um, making statements about the workforce and working with Health Education England, which hasn't come up yet on that. On pharmacy, there is increasing evidence that pharmacists uh, can manage um, guideline-based care, long-term conditions many can prescribe now. They're an untapped resource. Their training has gone up to four and now five years in some areas. Um, but as GPs, we tend to be rather protective on one hand about what we do, and on the other hand say, as Kay said, we're exhausted because all the work is coming at us. And I think one of the things about leadership, which Kay um, might want to, to reflect on is, uh, leadership isn't just about protecting your own and doing more. It's about working with teams in a much more constructive way uh, and building the teams. It's not about just about GP numbers. It's about the workforce as a whole. Thank you. We have one, la one last question, and then we must move on. I will run on one. Um, no, it was a bit of a, a reassurance to Camilla that um, the work we're doing on the uh, National Information Governance Committee is more about sharing than restricting information. Um, I think that's the area we think as a committee, and of course the board will have to take a view on that when we bring it to you, um, that that is the area where, where there is the most urgent work to be done. Good. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much for that. Um, David, the finance, finance report. Okay. Uh, thanks, David. Um, um, thank you. Um, so if I just draw colleagues' attention to uh, the table in paragraph two, this sets out the summary of the high-level of our performance to date. This is at the um, 30th of September. You can see the budget um, 
available to that point in time is 43 million. We've spent 37. That's a variance of 6.2 if you put the roundings in. Um, that's broken down further in paragraph 2.2, .2, which shows the recurring revenue budget and shows the figures there where uh, the equivalents are uh, the budget for the period to the 30th is 37.2 million and we've spent 34. That's giving a variance of 3.2. And if I can just race you to 2.3, this shows the transformation budget and the current performance. Again, budget is 6.5, spend is 3.5, giving a variance of 3. Um, I'm not particularly worried about this at the present time. Um, um, we've got contracts which we need to let in terms of the transformation which will spend against that overall budget. I think the issue, as I said last time, is making sure what we spend we need to spend, not uh, are we spending all of this money and we're spending it appropriately. Um, on the capital budget, which is at 2.4, um, you can see what we've got is a budget of 17, of which um, uh, all but 11.5 is allocated. So we've got 11.5 unallocated, and that explains a large variance in relation to the capital spend, and that is something that we need to look at as we go into the next stage of the transformation programme. Uh, we need to settle this issue about offices and hubs. Uh, we need to settle the issue about what's the information platform that we need to move uh, forward on. Uh, the majority of the money that's being spent in capital to date is really about um, developing um, the uh, information technology infrastructure on which we uh, operate and um, I think uh, as we develop further our uh, new methodologies there will be further requirements to um, set plans against that unallocated <laughs> capital budget which we'll bring back. So, uh, broadly, that's the report, David. Um, I, I think we're in a, a, a healthy place in relation to the budget. As I say, I'm not personally worried about whether uh, we've got these underspends. Uh, I know this is not always the right thing to say, but I think we're spending this money appropriately, and that's the more important thing, that if we are called to account for how we've spent and what we've spent, we can actually um, we can do that. So um, I think that's the report. Helen? Um, I don't think it's possible for the board to assess from these charts whether the money's been spent effectively. I mean, it's just not possible for us, is it? Because we can see it's, it's, rel it's all relative to budget, but we don't have any more detail. So I thought we'd had a discussion about this before and we were going to get more detail. I mean, whether that goes to a separate committee, I don't mind, but I'm, ju I'm just concerned that we don't, I'm not, I don't know what other people feel, I don't think it's possible for us to make any assessment at all no. about how this money's been spent from this limited information? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to a point of the Director of Corporate Services before we really grip this in a sort of formal way, because that will report to that person, finance. And I mean, I don't, th I don't want the board to spend a lot of time, because I think the other <coughs> issues, the regulatory issues that we're discussing are more important. But we do, but we do, you're saying we do need to have assurance that the money is being spent properly. It's your issue, I think, isn't it? Um, I have raised this before, and I'm just a bit concerned that we, we haven't sort of got there. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you're, presumably, whatever, the, the, I, mean, I agree we don't want to spend huge amounts of time on it, but the Director of Corporate Services is going to need to see detail, aren't they? So it, yeah. it should be in the system somewhere. Steve? Um, I think um, Camilla's got a very strong point. Um, but I think um, in other organizations that I've been involved with, um, you have to have performance on the same agenda as um, the budget, uh, budget performance, because one reflects the other. Um, and um, you know, when we get the Director of Corporate um, Governance, then maybe that's the way to approach it, um, because it, both, the, both the, ex the expenditure and the performance have to relate back to the business plan, and they have to be tied in quite closely together. Um, and I think we are very, very preoccupied with a whole series of other um, matters at the moment um, that naturally take our uh, take priority, but I think in due, in due course, we perhaps will need to develop a way of having performance and the budget relating to the business plan as a regular feature of these meetings. Yeah, David, well, we, can I just mm, support, support mm. that? Uh, I, I mean, I've got two concerns. The first is about the overall reporting of finance against activity and against objectives. The other is um, David preempted my question by 
reassuring us that there isn't a problem with the transformation budget, which is now significantly adrift from the profile that we originally adopted. Um, I, I mean, I accept, I've raised this before, I accept the assurance that's been given today, but I am still very uneasy that um, this banana-shaped um, profile of spending is getting more and more um, uh, difficult to achieve, in my view. As I understand the government accounting system, if we don't spend the money this year, we lose it. And that's not an argument for spending it unnecessarily, but it is a, a, a warning light on the dashboard that we presumably bid for this money to do something. And if we're going to lose two or three million pounds of it, then they we're going, not going to be able to do whatever it was we thought we were going to do with that money. Um, uh, in particular, the, a significant part of the underspend on the transformation budget is to do with the new approach. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm not looking for an answer now. I'm just saying I'm, I think when we get the Director of Corporate Services, it would be really helpful if he could or she could, as an early stage, um, look at the importance of improving this particular side of our reporting. Mm. Anna? Sorry, uh, I don't want to extend the debate. But, I mean, I do, I, I do want to agree with Camilla that I think we don't have what we need if we as a board are to be um, uh, accountable for um, uh, financial management of the organisation. And I suppose that's, that's, that's slightly my, my, my question mark here because I'm kind of mindful of the relationship between the board and the accounting officer responsibilities. And I just think there's a, there's, there's a question about what level of detail gets put in front of us, but there's also a question about what we think the right um, governance uh, uh, is around the finances of an organisation such as the CQC and I would really welcome having that conversation and I, I think um, perhaps we might be able to have that conversation ahead of a Director of Corporate Resources but certainly I think it, if not it should be a priority for them because I think that's the issue for me is what, what are we actually accountable for and then fr follows from that what, 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 what do we need to have put in front of us? No, okay. no I mean, uh, look... I think I, I think I can't disagree with any of the points that have been made. Actually, we just d do need to add to this <laughs> this, yeah. this misery. Because um, I think we all, we're all in, in yeah, we are. huge yeah. agreement on this. I think. And, and but also it, it, the situation we have at the moment is is unusual, if you like. <laughs> you know, it's changing day hour by hour, and. Um, you know, I, I absolutely support that we need to get get this right, and you know, there's nothing I disagree with. But I think at the, also at the moment we are in quite a unusual situation. That's, you know, we haven't got time on our hands. We've, you know, we've got a lot to do. Um, uh, so I just wanted to make that point. The sort okay, of co no. current context. Yeah. Okay. I, I, we we will endeavour. Lewis, do you want to add to that? Before? Uh, it's just different, a slightly different point, but um, the the. Um, uh, the question is partly what, what questions do we have as a board that we'd like to know the answer to? And what, what, one of them um, is a slightly less technical and detailed question than the way the finances are set out, and that's how we divide the uh, resources of the organisation between different work streams, different parts of what we do. Uh, so we now have three major work streams, as I understand it. We have uh, under the three chief inspectors. Uh, and it, it, would, it would help me a lot to understand how our resources are divided between those work streams. Now, I realise that some of the money may not be easily allocated to one or another, but it would still be useful to know because that will give an impression about the relative priority within the organisation. Yeah. There's, a, there's a supplementary to that, which mm -hmm. is the second question would be um, when um, the Francis report came out and there was a government response to uh, about CQC, there was talk then of a, uh, an additional sum of money, which, it, which may be, I just don't know, um, the same as the transformation budget, except that the amounts were, uh, th that were in the public domain were a little bit different from what's in this paper. So people were talking about £40 million. Um, and I don't see £40 million in this paper. So my, my first question was about the allocation within the organisation's priorities. The second one is, what is happening to the additional money what are we using it for? This was given because of what had happened at Mid Staffordshire and elsewhere. What, what does that additional money buy us? Okay. Look, there are three. There are three questions there. There's the ongoing good financial governance of the organisation, which I think was where Camilla started from, and I think we can we we, we must address that, and we'll do. Uh, we will do that. I know we said that last time, I think, but we will we'll do that. That's the first point. The second point that you make, Lewis, is 
can we allocate the money between the three sort of chief inspector areas, if you like? And I think at the moment it's too early to do that, really. But we can do but when we do the budget for next year. Clearly, that is how we will do it. So you'll see that very clearly. And then the third point is just which is related to the first point, is just getting a grip on this transformation budget, how much it is and how we're spending it. So can, can you leave it for us to bring back to the next board? Can you make a, a note that we'll do that at the next board meeting? Okay. David, could I just perhaps make one quick point mm. to help Lewis, which is that the total sum of money allocated by the government is over multi-years, and therefore you've got to, this, what's in here is a share of a three-year program. That's why there are two different figures. But we'll set that out clearly for you at the next meeting. Um, good, thank you. Um, moving on, David, the transformation program. Um, so, um, what you've got here is uh, uh, an update on the transformation program. Uh, this is the uh, governance, uh, I use that word advisedly, that was in place in relation to the changes that we are uh, introducing and uh, making. It's a brief report uh, um, that sets out the overarching arrangements and confirms that there is um, a gateway review which is due to take place in early November, which will be led by the Department of Health with accredited gate. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, did anybody get any of that? So, um, <coughs> um, this is the transformation program report. We're reporting our overall progress at Red Amber. Uh, this is the governance that we've got in place uh, in relation to the specific projects and programs that are part of the transformation program. Um, progress is being made, and uh, as I'm saying in the uh, last paragraph, um, there is to be a gateway review. This is an external assessment of the preparedness of this program and the robustness of the program to actually deliver the uh, project that we've got uh, in place. Um, DH will lead this and they'll have external gateway reviewers um, and will report the main findings of that back to uh, the November meeting of this board. Uh, in summary, is it, Chair? Yeah, we're having a more detailed presentation this afternoon at the private meeting on, the, on this. Okay. <coughs> right, David, the next one is... Uh, next item is complaints. Okay, so um, this report is doing uh, two things. Um, it's uh, providing you with a, a quarterly report which looks at the first two quarters of this year in the information and then draws out an analysis of not just the numbers of complaints that we've received in CQC, but of the content of those complaints and some of the issues that they flag up for the future work. The numbers, as you can see, set out uh, on um, pages uh, uh, numbered uh, one and two. And the top of page three gives, uh, I hope, a sense of uh, both the overall volume of complaints and how they've been uh, subdivided. There's some analysis in the following paragraphs. Um, in three, we go on to look at what some of the learning is to be extracted from these uh, complaints and uh, how uh, changes uh, are being uh, introduced as a consequence of the complaints. And in uh, paragraph five, we again flag up uh, the further work that we'll undertake in relation to complaints. Paul. Uh, has um, that future work in hand. What we'd intend to do, Chair, is bring this report, which extracts the learning of complaints, along with um, the overall performance reports, uh, together uh, on the same agenda. Uh, so you've got a sense of um, both performance, uh, previous debate, finance, and, um, uh, and what people are saying about uh, the work that we do. There's a number of issues in this report um, which are worth probably bearing out. One is uh, the way that occasionally complaints can be made about against CQC and how that can be conflated with representations being made against warning notices <coughs> and how it's important to unpick that. And so one of the learning points is to introduce a representations against warning notices 
uh, that actually allows this distinction between the complaint against the, in a sense, uh, I think it's reflected as the conduct of staff, uh, which can often be conflated uh, with a challenge on a warning notice. Often those challenges come from two legal firms that are recruited by organisations uh, to act on their behalf. Um, the other issue that's uh, drawn out is there are a number of people, and I'm not sure the language is right here. Kay and myself have had some exchange about this um, over the past um, couple of weeks or so about how people who have complained often to our predecessor organisations as well as to this organisation, so they've been doing this for an awful long time. Um, and occasionally... Um, um, that has caused problems in the way that the both uh, described in internal reports, a language that we've used internally, um, and, um, uh, and also about knowing what the next steps are. How well do we deal with people that have been complaining for a protracted period of time? What is the appropriate relationship to have with them? Uh, how can people be treated in a way that signals care and compassion? Um, particularly if people have been complaining over a number of years. And indeed, where after a number of years, people uh, then see one part of the system about which they've been complaining and accept that they got this wrong 10 years ago. It, it is one of these key issues about how people feel listened to and not listened to and what our role is in there. So I've, we've tried to set this out in paragraphs 2.2 .2 and uh, be, uh, beyond about whether we've got the right policy and how we deal with that. We do have some arrangements in place which is set out at 2.5 about what we've called complex complaints where a panel is brought together so it puts less of the responsibility on the complaints team, the central complaints team, which is a very small resource um, in the way that they uh, can actually bring uh, more than one mind, so to speak, to um, responding to uh, these complaints. So I hope what this does, uh, David and colleagues, is just set out uh, activity over the first uh, six months of this year and actually sets out some of the learning. It's also flagging that there's more work we need to do to make sure we've got the right tone and style in relation to dealing with complaints. Um, and uh, we need to build that into the next steps. I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns that um, members of the board have done. Okay, and Paul? I'm very pleased to um, uh, receive the, the report. Um, there are two things. One is just to reinforce that I think it's important that our, um, you know, our staff are trained appropriately in, in both um, uh, recording and managing complaints. Because, um, to be honest, it seems a bit low the number of complaints we get, actually. Um, but also, you know, we need in terms of if. if there is a complaint you know we need to make sure that that staff feel comfortable in recording it and reporting it because we have had a culture that, that we know that has been quite um fearful should we say and it's quite you know it's a big deal to have a complaint raised against you so on one hand i feel that we definitely need to sort of train staff and encourage them to um uh, to sort of record and report complaints but also make sure that they're supported and they understand um you know that they're not going to be judged until the well until the complaints after you know concluded but um and the other thing is the, the issue about this uh, the um you never know the, the terminology but people who do complain um about the same issue for years and years um and they are people often who have had some really awful things happen and frankly it has been covered up to be honest you know um and how we deal with that because it seems that that um you know, it, it does need to be managed because it takes a lot of time. Um, you know, and there are also people, to be frank, um, and there may be a separate group, I don't know, who have, uh, have actually been quite abusive. And I think that certainly one or two of things I've heard, I feel that it's overstepped the mark. Now, it seems that we are dealing with it in terms of having, you know, um, recorded messages and, and whatever. Um, and, but it is a fine line, you know, particularly if people have you know, suffered very badly and uh, also have suffered a la lack of justice. Um, so, so it's, you know, I'm very pleased to hear that we're dealing with that. What I did wonder is whether um, the Regulatory Governance and Values Committee has a role. I don't, I'm not going to sort of particularly define it, but 
Um, and, and it would, it, it's along the lines of partly taking the, the pressure off the, the staff as well, but also to bring in a, an element of um, sort of uh, scrutiny or oversight. For example, you know, say there was somebody who had been complaining a lot and was taking a lot of time, and um, there was felt that we needed to Im implement the um, persistent complainers policy or whatever. It could be, for example, that one or two members of the um, our GNV committee could actually look at that to check whether we've done everything we could, um, is it reasonable, fair, you know, um, and, and indeed whether there was any other role for that committee also around um, complaints as well. Um, I don't think we should get heavily involved in overseeing all the complaints, you know, for one moment, but there may be potentially an issue around certain, certain things like sort of complex or persistent complainers. Uh, Paul then lowers. So, as far as our future plan of work goes on, the, the, if I draw out two things, for, uh, firstly that this is um, this is something that's being reviewed uh, more widely as regards the uh, acute hospital sector by Anne Cleward and Trish Hart. Uh, that's been quite a long review launched uh, in the in the wake of the Second Francis report, and due to report pretty shortly, um, is my understanding. We've played uh, into that review within the um, uh, the constraints of being an independent review, of course. Um, we expect it to make recommendations for uh, for our role. Um, as, as we look at the way in which we handle uh, people's concerns uh, and staff concerns, um, we know there are at least two things which we just, we, we will do differently. So one is to be much clearer uh, on our website and uh, general communications about what our role in concerns uh, is and we frankly want to dispel the myth that we don't look at or shouldn't look at concerns. We do and we should. There is a difference between uh, us in, uh, looking at individual concerns for the purposes of understanding the quality and safety of services versus the uh, investigating on behalf of the individual for the purposes of recourse. And we can make that clear, but it's really important, it seems to me, that we go straight through that myth that we don't or shouldn't, both for the public and for our staff, so they know what they're... Um, what they can do, they're empowered to do. Uh, the other part of, uh, that Mike uh, and I are, uh, and colleagues are working on quite closely is how we more heavily play uh, people's concerns and staff's concerns into the inspection process. Um, and we're looking at how we can gear up for that at least a month before uh, we, we go in for an in-depth inspection. Uh, we think, for example, interviewing people who are willing to come forward, recent whistleblowers, for example, a representative sample uh, of the public is something well worth exploring, it's something that we, we uh, look to test as part of, uh, of Wave 2. So just to cite the board on uh, those two pieces, and that Malta Gerholt, the uh, incoming strategy unit director who starts on Monday, will be taking on this piece of work uh, as a priority for him. Uh, well, thank you. That, uh, that's very helpful, Paul, actually. Um, I think we are... At the moment, um, we are trying to do something that's quite um, difficult. It's quite a difficult balance because we are putting out the message that we want to know more about complaints. We want to hear more from people who've got complaints to make. Uh, and we will use complaints in the way that we assess organisations. Um, but when people contact us about complaints, we sometimes say that's actually not our, our role. Um, and that is, th and th th getting that, that message right, so that it's clear what, what we are saying it will be very important because it for all the reasons that you've just outlined Paul I think that clarity will be very helpful um, th there's a, an additional element to this which is that people are sometimes not at the point of complaining they are often at the point of saying something happened which may have meant that something went wrong but it has been very distressing and we'd like to know what what it was that happened and what's our way of finding that out and certainly what people say to me is that it's th at that point of asking what happened that they find the the, the totality of the system uh, quite bewildering uh, and so may contact CQC but it might not it might not be CQC uh, to hear well actually you ca we can't consider this because the trust has to consider it first or the there's the ombudsman or there may be the coroner um, you know, th there's a whole set of people and a kind of order to events which has to be applied and people find that very um, they do find that puzzling uh, and bear in mind that they're often in a distressed state, so they also find it very up, up, upsetting. It's, it, it's easy to feel that that's 
um, some sort of system giving you a sort of brush off. Uh, and uh, getting that part right, explaining not just our role, but, the, but how the system can help you, um, and not just how it can pass you from one place to the other, uh, will, be, will be very important. Thanks very much. So um, I, I, I very much welcome the, the what I take to what I'm, I'm, I would describe as kind of prelimi preliminary work, if you like, this kind of grappling with what kind of complaints we get and this categorization, I think, is really helpful and kind of pulling those three are areas apart and uh, getting um, uh, some of the data in, in, in front of us about how many and of what sort and which areas and things, that's, that's all, all, all great. Um, and uh, uh, of course, Paul's was absolutely right. This is a space in which they're we're waiting for some 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 uh, sense of what everyone's roles will be in in uh, relation to complaints going forward. But um, so so I suppose what I want to do um, uh, is so when I read this, I was kind of disappointed, but I understand why. And what I was disappointed about, and what I'd like to see in the next bit, really, um, is is uh, starting from the premise that um, uh, since uh, complaints is an area that we should should take an interest in in relation to the inspection work that we do, complaints is an area in which we have to excel ourselves um, because we are in no position to comment on the way that others handle complaints unless we uh, are quite exemplary in this space. And I think that's, you know, that's a really big challenge. Um, and I would observe that, um, uh, and this is not a comment on the individuals concerned at all uh, inside the CQC because I think it's a terribly difficult thing to get right, but I don't see that in this report. And I suppose one of the things I don't see in this report, which I would really hope that we would get next time we th think about this, when, once more has th sort of thought about it a bit more, um, is a really clear sense of what, what the outcomes are that we want to uh, promise people in relation to complaints. So what I see here is lots of management and process. Um, and there's no question that you need all of that. But what, 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 what is our promise to these three categories of complainant about what uh, outcomes we want to deliver for them? And I don't mean uh, you know, that, that they will always be happy with what it is that we say, of course. What I, what, what, but what I mean are some, some, some things about the quality of the way that we will approach this, the timeliness with which we will approach it, the, uh, uh, um, the empathy that we'll show in dealing with it, all those sorts of things I think we really need to think about. And, um, and I would say that, in a way, this report does, f for me, a, a, a little bit of a disservice to the individuals in the organisation who are dealing with this, whether it's in writing or on the phone. I, mean, I was in Newcastle uh, 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 10 days ago with some of the staff who were answering the phones, taking some of these sorts of things. And they, they, they are all about the outcome as far as the complainant is concerned um, or, or the person who's raising a concern because they are... Um, nothing if not deeply empathetic uh, uh, to the people on the end of the phone. That was my kind of observation, my takeaway, if you like. So somehow we need to capture that from them and, uh, and incorporate it in, in, into our, our, our approach to complaints and start there rather than with the process. No, I, I think there's a lot of very good stuff in the contributions that people have made, and, and I concur with quite a lot of it, well, almost all of it. Um, and um, it just occurred to me that, you know, there are two, two types of complaint um, categorising them in a different way. There are the ones that are, are about um, the CQC's performance, and there are ones about services that we um, regulate. And I think um, we, we possibly need to split them apart a bit more in these reports in future. Um, and I'm concerned that we're getting so many about um, staff conduct, which, as Lewis said, is often as a result of frustrations with the system. Um, and they just understandably, if not, uh, though you can't necessarily agree with them, um, have a possibly the habit of taking it out of the people who are talking to them on the phone when they make the complaint. Um, and I'm not sure if we're giving staff enough support in that area. Um, so that, that, that was one aspect. Um, I think the other thing is um, what Paul was saying about the messaging and what we tell people when they make a complaint and how we use that information is really at the heart of this, because if we get that right, then some of the anger will dissipate um, if they feel that their message is getting across. Um, I think my experience of people who make complaints is generally they just don't want it to happen to anyone else. They accept the mistake has been made. If there's an apology, if there's a right approach, that often dissipates the effect. Um, and, and then just on lastly, on, on case point, I would just be cautious because I think complaints have to come to the board. I think it's really important that the, 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 the board deals with um, the complaints report because this is where the learning um, has to start. Um, and then the second part of that, um, not that I don't think there is a role for the new committee, um, the procedure around complaints has got to be absolutely transparent and crystal clear. And if you have a committee that can occasionally dip in when something looks a bit complicated, um, that way madness lies.
So I would just caution about that. Thank you. Um, can I first of all say I think this is this report is a, a step change from previous reports in that there's much more analysis and exploration of the issue rather than simply a processing report about numbers. So I was very grateful for that. However, as, as has already been said, uh, quite a lot of this is actually about management and process. Um, and while it's interesting, uh, um, it's something that obviously needs to be sorted out. It doesn't seem to me to, to engage us in what we can learn about the organization from those complaints. And what particularly struck me was the paragraph at the top of page four which says, of the complaints that are upheld, the majority, 80%, are usually upheld on the grounds of poor communication, not telling people when there is going to be a delay, not communicating with people in a timely manner, or raising their expectations in so that something will be done and then not doing it. Now, that, as a seasoned bureaucrat, I started to dissect that sentence. And, um, there are two issues that emerged for me from it. The first was the complaint may well have been about something else but was upheld on those grounds. So I would quite like to be clear, not now but at some point in the future, the extent to which the complaint was about A but we upheld it on the grounds that we hadn't reacted to A in an appropriate way rather than the substance of whatever A was about. That seems to me a critical issue. If the complaint was about taking a long time or promising things that we didn't do, then obviously A and this, these words are the same thing, which is different. The, that's my first question. The second query was really what then we've done with all of that a crucial piece of information. And I looked through the learning from complaints and I looked through various other bits and I couldn't really find what the significance of that reporting was. What is this a generic problem? Is there a particular problem in particular parts of the organization? Is there something that we need to do about um, expect our expectations of colleagues when they respond to complaints, when they talk to people ordinarily and so on? And it's that learning about the substance of particularly of complaints which are upheld rather than the, you know, the very interesting issue about persistent complainants, which frankly I think ought to have been in an appendix rather than in the the substance of the report. So I'm sorry to, to, in my usual style, leave you with more questions than answers, but. Just one point, partly in response to, to, um, uh, to the issue Kay raised. In fact, I think Claire has arranged for Susanna Burden to come to the, what will be the first meeting of the uh, Regulatory Governance and Values Committee, this much delayed um, meeting, which I think um, the good news is every member of the committee can now attend on the new date. And also, um, I think we're arranging, if possible, for James Titcombe to be at that meeting because complaints are going to be on the agenda. I, I actually found about the, I, I found this report quite confusing, actually in terms of the classification of complaints because there are a significant number of complaints about the services that CQC regulates and I wasn't clear whether you know, this is a point about when a complaint about the service then becomes a complaint about the CQC I think we need to get a better understanding of that. So I think that there is some room here for, um, you know, again, to take John's point without being overly bureaucratic, um, to sort of classify these complaints in a, um, in a slightly different way. I was also very surprised that, well, that's, again, it's difficult to track. I wasn't completely sure about the numbers here but the complaints about judgments made by individual inspectors seem to be very low. Uh, and maybe, you know, that's good in the sense that um, K 
care homes in particular are ex accept the judgments that are made by them, but I was surprised at how few complaints there were about the inspections themselves. But this may be a classification issue, and I think it just emphasizes the importance of really understanding what each of these lines actually means. But we will have a first go at this um, at our first meeting. Thanks very much. I won't take much time because I know we don't have much time. I just wanted to pick up um, something that Steve talked about earlier on. He talked about um, patient loyalty to GP practices, um, which is exactly what the, um, the, the primary thing that I wanted to report on uh, to the board. Um, our annual report is all about. So it's titled Grateful Today, um, Loyal Today, whatever. Um, Grateful Today, Powerful Tomorrow. And I, I suppose two things about this report. One is... Um, which I know you've all got copies of, but one is that um, I understand this report. Um, I take this report as, if you like, as being um, a, a setting out of the Health Watch England stall. This is what we will be about um, uh, uh, as an organisation. It's not quite finished business, as you, 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 you've seen if you've had a chance to read it. The rights that we've published are still um, to, to, it's going to be subject to some further consultation. Um, but but uh, but this will set an agenda for the organisation for the um, medium, if not the long term. So um, uh, so I think it is very important for us, and I'm I'm personally really really pleased to have it out there and uh, being discussed. And it is being discussed, which is also uh, a, a great thing. Um, uh, we, we I want to just point you though not to the hard copy, but to uh, the website. Um, because the material on the website is very differently presented um, uh, deliberately. It, you can print out a PDF, but you don't have to. And actually, you can begin to engage in a conversation with us and with each other about uh, the rights. Um, there was a, a lot of activity on, on, on that site the day it was uh, launched. Uh, under each, there are all sorts, there's a kind of BBC type forum where people can talk uh, uh, about their understanding of each of the rights uh, and their response to uh, what we've said. Um, there's also a, 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 a live page which I'll point you to because I know that everyone is really, really interested in what Local Health Watch are doing. So um, if, if you look at our website, you'll see a, 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 a little um, whatever it is that looks like this. And if you click on it, um, uh, then it takes you through to uh, a, a map of England, uh, which is currently populated with about 15 different health watch, local health watch examples. But w this will uh, be built and developed as uh, uh, we do our work. And we're getting more and more examples from local health watch of the kinds of very, very different things. And I think that's what's most interesting at the moment about this map. They are all doing such different things at the moment. Um, so uh, this map will continue to build. We'll put up new examples. And so the website that um, sort of additions around the annual report are not um, a dead annual report. They are a live conversation with the public about our, uh, um, uh, 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 what we're saying and a live, co live sort of uh, opportunity to see what Local Health Watch are doing as we add more examples. So I very much encourage you to have a look at the website. I just I think the um, the grateful today, powerful tomorrow. I don't know who came up with that strap line, but it's a, it's a it really just sums it up incredibly well. Was that you? Or? No, no, no. We, no. It, 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 it's a few of us. Yeah. No, I think you really like it, and Andrea. Um, uh, thank you, David. Um, uh, just to say that I was really pleased to uh, be able to go to the launch um, uh, of the annual report um, uh, uh, last week, and it was um, uh, good to see so much support um, from uh, uh, various partners um, at that. One of the issues that's been raised has been the rights um, uh, that, um, uh, that, that you mentioned, um, Anna, and uh, some kind of pushback from people around how this links with the NHS constitution. And uh, one of the reasons why I think that the, the initiative that you're taking forward um, is, is really very powerful is because it actually goes beyond the health service and stretches into adult social care as, dis you know, and you've heard me say this before, despite the name, Health Watch does indeed cover adult social care, uh, uh, social care um, uh, uh, as well as health care. Um, but uh, so I think that the rights kind of going into that territory is really helpful. Um, but I think that there is something that we 
perhaps collectively need to think about um, and work with you on um, around how we how we make that clear with people, how the coordination across with what does what does the NHS constitution mean for people, um, how does it all link up with the rights, and how we can use this in adult social care as well, and linking up with some of the other initiatives um, that have happened, um, particularly in social care, like the um, Think Local at Personal Making It Real I statements, which again are very powerful and have been co-produced with people who are using services and carers. So I think I think there's a bit of that work to be done, but kind of really great to see you uh, um, starting the conversation. Sorry, can I just say one thing about just the NHS constitution, which is really just to say that um, you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a discussion not finished, but it, it is a discussion that began six months ago um, with uh, the expert group that's been advising on the NHS constitution. And I think Steve was at a meeting yesterday where there was a very lively conversation about this, uh, uh, the relationship between um, our work and the NHS constitution. But what's really clear, um, and I, I think I've reported before, but I'll repeat myself, uh, is that um, the NHS constitution sits very comfortably, it really does uh, sit comfortably uh, within our rights. So our rights are kind of broader, as you rightly say, in terms of social care. They're, um, they're at a slightly higher level. They have less, they're, they're less granular than many of the things within the NHS constitution. They're not meant to be uh, um, instead of uh, at all. They are, uh, um, uh, and, uh, I mean, I hope what will be an enhancement and a further development. And, some, and, and, and we are actively talking about how we can pull the two together uh, in communication with uh, uh, users and consumers of health and social care. So, um, yes, point taken, but it is a work in progress. Yeah, can you be fairly quick on this one? We're sorry, we're running a bit okay, behind very, schedule. Okay, very quickly, yes. Um, I mean, I've been sort of uh, following a few health, local health watches, and um, some of them are doing you know, great work, and obviously others are at an earlier stage. And you mentioned that they're all doing very different things. So on one hand, I think, you know, diversity is, is good, but it's also, I find it quite difficult to, to actually say what Health Watch does, you know, because people, uh, you know, I feel I ought to be able to say, well, this, you know, this is Health Watch's role, or this should be Health Watch, but because it's so different on a local level, it, it's difficult to say that, and other than to say it's the voice of consumers, um, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but, but it's, it's, you know, and I end up saying not very much, <laughs> you know, and I just wondered what you thought about, you know, um, yeah, how, how, I mean, it's partly the relationship between Health Watch and CQC, actually, because we haven't had a, a, a lot of discussion about that um, for various reasons, and it would be good to have that. Um, but also, um, you know, how, how we can sort of communicate about it in a way that, that, that sort of is, is helpful and, and joined up. So... Um, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a technical answer to this and a kind of a, 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 another answer. Um, I think a conversation about um, the relationship between Health Watch and Local Health Watch and CQC would be a, a, a very good thing to, to, to have. Um, and I think David and I have even got an hour at the end of today when we wanted to have that conversation a bit more and develop our thinking there. Um, so, uh, so absolutely, yes. Um, at the technical level, there's a, there's, there's, although everyone is going, all the local health watches are going off and doing very much their own thing, which is the many flowers blooming kind of model, which is what, what, what's great and very um, innovative and entrepreneurial. Um, uh, uh, there is um, a body of work which is beginning now, which is about trying to establish what, what, what the stand, what, you know, what good might look like for local health watch. So uh, in my report, there's reference to um, an outcomes and impact tool, which we've been developing with the LGA. That's the, uh, the local government association. So that's the first uh, uh, step on that path. Uh, local Health Watch will all produce their first annual reports um, in March, and I think that will um, give us a much better picture uh, for what they're doing across the, the, the whole spectrum of their responsibilities. And we're doing um, a, 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 an annual survey of all Local Health Watch uh, between then and now. Uh, which will also give us a much better picture. So by the time we move into kind of the spring of 2014, I think we will have a much better sense, uh, um, and that will help us to develop some standards around what good looks like. Um, in the meantime, I take your point about what, how to communicate and uh, what to lay claim to, so uh, we'll give that a bit of thought. Good. Um, thank, um, thank you very much. Um, any other business? And, uh, yes, for the gentleman in the bag. Graham Wilkinson, oh. Graham Wilkinson, Chairman of the Resident Association, Ada Court, Maida Vale. 
also a member of Westminster Health Watch and um, the British Lung Foundation. Is it possible that the board might accept some input from, if you like, uh, ordinary people today? Only five or ten minutes. Yeah, far, far away is your yeah. chance, yeah. Well, with regards to what uh, Mr. Field was talking about uh, minutes ago with regards to um, records, two years ago I was invited to the NHS at um, St. Mary's and we were informed there that all records would be co computerized so that doctors, hospitals, ambulance drivers all have patients' medical histories at their hands so they can do it. It's still, it still hasn't happened. So you get somebody taken away and even the ambulance driver has to ask a near relative or what's happened to the patient themselves without going on the computer because it still hasn't happened. With regards to um, senior social services, that's our biggest obstacle at the moment. I'm sorry, but it is. We find it all the time. They alienate us all the time. As soon as we, they, they think we're getting in too deep with people that need help, they alienate us. They've done it with one particular case. We found out that a particular lady, she's 94 years old, and we found out that she had figures in that region of six figures in the bank. Now, we decided that she'd got no family, and she also agreed to it. And she came from, funnily enough, she came from the same town as Lord Donaldson. So they were able to communicate verbally between the pair of them because they, they had things in common. We decided to make, have her make her will out because she wanted all her goods and shackles to go to St. John's Hospice. Then suddenly, so adult social services get involved and we get alienated, suggesting that we're after the money. So then we said, okay, then if that's the way you feel, we'll ask the solicitor if he'll go as, benefit, as the um, name on, on the will. And that takes us out of, out of the equation then. Oh, no, nothing then. Since then, that lady has got enough money to provide care for the rest of her life to the decency that she's, she should get, but she doesn't. I've had counsellors come to meetings with us and promised us with a cohort of... I'm not going to give out any names. A cohort of, of hers promising us that that lady would get specialist dementia care. Every person that's come from that particular care agency that's turned up do you work for Westminster uh, Dementia Care? No, we work for such and such a thing. And out of the four carers she's got, only one she can relate to, and she appreciates and understands, and they both understand each other. Now they've changed that lady's hours. That's one instance. My partner had a stroke, and therefore I requested, obviously, when she came out of rehab, does she get there? She needs care because she's paralyzed down one side. One of my degrees is in psychology. I understand that with a stroke, it's not just a paralyzed bit that you've got to understand, it's this. If you're paralyzed on the left-hand side, the right-hand side of your brain isn't working. Therefore, you've got to accommodate that to, so that the right left side can eventually take over. Care workers are not instructed to be able to understand things like that. They come, change a nappy, do things, and shoot off. Now, then, I have one social work, one social care manager wanted me to sign hours that care workers weren't even there. And I refused to do it because I found it's fraud. So then she turns to my partner and says, well, you've got one arm, you can sign it. I'm sorry. No, that's not what's going to happen. We got rid of her, got a new care company in. Now, the social worker of this new care company, I had a meeting with the care company because the Stroke Society told me to try and get out of the situation because I was spending 10 hours a day with this lady and doing most of what the care workers should have done, apart from changing, obviously. And I was advised that it would affect my health if I didn't pull out away from the, the, the helping this lady, so I did do. I had a meeting with the care company five weeks ago. Two weeks down the line, the, care, so, the social care manager decides to ring me. Oh, can I have a meeting with you? I want to ask you these questions. Uh, excuse me, I've already answered these questions to the care company. We've decided what's going to go on. You contact them, you keep in touch with them, you can see what goes on. Now, even as far as this week, which is now five weeks down the line, he's still not taken over the, the care of that lady's bank accounts and finances. The care company can't do it because the care workers are not allowed to touch the money. They weren't allowed to touch the medication. I got the medication put into blister packs, apart from the warfarin, which is separate because the dose changes every week. Therefore, the district nurse has to apply warfarin. I've got no problems with that. But it, our biggest stumbling block is social care. 
adult social care. And then when I wrote to, when I got into the depth of it, I wrote to the managing director of this particular care firm, and of course they quoted, um, well, we've been accredited by Quality Care Commission. That sent us straight onto your website then, and we found out your little green ticks, and it all looks fine and rosy until you go into the little green ticks. The particular care company, which I shan't mention, I'm working. The care, the care, the, the inspection. This is what I object to, is your inspection method, or lack of. A previous check of this standard was based on declarations and evidence given by this care service. They're not going to tell you that, oh no, we're a rubbish company and we don't do this, that and the other, are they? Let's be honest, they're going to be wine and roses, oh yeah, sure. So the managing director quoted that to me, and I also quoted it to him that it was based on a telephone call and not a physical inspection. Regular care workers, timekeeping, all supposedly passed by CQC for you to be able to put your name or their, you, them, put your name or CQC on their letter headings. People should be cared for by staff properly qualified and able to do their job. I pulled one of the care workers who was no more than 20 years of age in the kitchen butchering this pear. And I said to her, what are you doing there? She said, well, I don't normally do this. My mother does this for me. Then she couldn't use a washing machine. Same thing, my mother usually does. I then asked her, why are you in the job of care worker? That doesn't ap uh, apply to people should be cared for by staff who are probably qualified, does it? I think, can, should I, be can I just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we, we, why don't you join us for coffee afterwards? When we can, because you've got a detailed report there in, in your hands, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Off yeah. your website. Off, yeah, can we, can we pick it up after, uh, over coffee? Yeah, sure. Would that be all right? Because yeah. with Andrea is here as well, who's got the background in social services. Yeah, no problem. You've made some very powerful points. Can we pick it up with you over coffee? Yeah. No problem. Good. Well, thank you very much. David, yes. Yes. Lots of, lots of that just makes a strong argument for cameras. So it's rather nice to hear that there were going to be cameras uh, coming soon. Perhaps uh, that will give you some comfort. Uh, that at least we will know when the, camera, the, the cameras arrive, when they depart, and indeed whether they came at all. Good. Thank you, David. Excellent. Um, good. Thank you very much. We'll break for coffee. Thank you.